a lot of my life, I had a, a misunderstanding of what it was to be a Christian and what the Christian life was like. And uh, I don't know exactly where I got it, uh, but I held on to it for a long time. Um, and that was that there's bad people in the world, and then they meet Jesus, and then they become good people. Seemed simple, seemed to make sense. So therefore, if you're around Christians, you know, those are the good people, obviously, and if you're around people who aren't Christians, those are the bad people. It was easy to tell. The, the problem happened for me is that like, I saw myself as a bad person uh, early on, <laughs> for good reason probably, and, uh, and then I met Jesus, and then I stayed kind of the way I was. And then I was torn because I went, well, am I a Christian or am I still one of those bad people? Which one is it? So uh, as a uh, young teenager, I, I went to a Baptist church where they had the altar calls. Remember those? Uh, where you come up and accept Christ, uh, particularly the Sunday night service. And I went for maybe 50 times. <laughs> and they, and uh, the counselors who would come out, they'd go, well, here comes the missionary son. You know, they're all in trouble. You know? uh, but it was that I never seemed to get it right because the, this distinction between bad people and good people I thought the dividing line was that they uh, knew Jesus. Um, but then this kind of uh, came to me uh, a little bit um, because Christmas in San Diego, a few weeks before Christmas, uh, my uh, sister-in-law and my brother hosted my other brother and his wife and me and Eileen for a dinner at their house. Now in our family amongst us, young folk, <laughs> the kids, um, there's three things we never talk about. We do not talk about politics because there is a plethora of opinion there. Uh, and secondly, uh, we don't talk about each other's kids. <laughs> That's dangerous. And the third thing is we never ever talk about anything spiritual, Christian-y, anything like that, because uh, we have, uh... well, so what happened was in the middle of dinner, <laughs> we, uh, this discussion broke out because I happened to call my brother and his wife the pagans in the family. <laughs> and isn't it great that we've got, you know, a couple of pagans here? And, uh, and my sister-in-law, who is the Christian, took exception to that because she thought that sounded negative and that I might have been criticizing. Um, which led to a whole big discussion about, um, well, what exactly is a pagan? Does that mean that they're bad people? Uh, and, and, and my pagan brother asked, um, so are you saying that everybody outside of the church is a pagan? And I went, oh no, the church is filled with practicing pagans. <laughs> you know, I know that. In fact, there's a number of clergy who struggle with this, you know. <laughs> Not pointing fingers, but you know, uh, anyway. And so uh, this, this led to this huge discussion about what paganism uh, is and what it is to be a Christian, and we've never had that conversation among us kids about, well, what does it mean to be a Christian and to follow Jesus? What difference does that make? So that led me to think, what does it mean for us to have a relationship with Jesus Christ and, and that He's in our lives, and we're following him, like we talk about all the time, right? And, and he's the, the Lord of our life. How does that work? And that's what I want us to look at today. And in Romans chapter 12, so uh, this is a passage many of you uh, know very well. I just want to read a little bit too. Therefore, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. 
Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And by the grace given to me, I say to every single one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance to the measure of faith God's given you. So Lord, teach us. Teach us what it means that you're the center of our life and that we follow you. And show us how we might take steps forward in faith. Amen. Well, you've heard me talk about this before, so I'll do it again. That is that um, I think this uh, passage, which is so pivotal in the uh, understanding of the Christian life, this passage brings up a, an interesting thing, and that is that the foundation, the foundation, the, the absolute core of every change that goes on in our lives as followers of Jesus, all the changes, is rooted in one thing. In view of God's mercy, offer your body. This mercy, which we've talked about here so many times, uh, in, in, in uh, the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, uh, and I only know how to pronounce this because we were members of the Jewish Community Center in San Diego, so who knows why. And uh, it was so I could pronounce this, chesed, uh, Mercy, and I've had you practice this before, so I know you're good at it. Let's say it together. Chesed. No. <laughs> say it like you mean it. Chesed. Yeah, you got to clear the throat a little, you know. And uh, okay, and and this is tender mercy. It's 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 God's essential attitude towards us, and it's God's essential um, uh, way of relating to us. And it's because of this, at the core, that, that it changes everything in, in our world. So, let me get graphic here. So we have mercy at the very center of God's relating to us in our understanding what it is to, to be a follower of Christ. And, and in this mercy, uh, it begins to change us and transform us in different ways. Um, for example, it, it says, because of God's mercy, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, show up, present yourself. Not, not just the uh, spiritual side of your life, not just your philosophical thoughts, not just your questions about things. Present your bodies, the whole person, because of God's incredible mercy. That's, that's what worship becomes. It's not an intellectual exercise. It's not an emotional endeavor, although sometimes those things enter in. It's, you're here. You're here before the Lord and saying, because of your mercy, I bring myself to you. And, and, and that becomes an act of, of um, worship. Now, I've had a lot of friends over the years who think that they can, uh, you know, worship uh, without showing up. You know, I, I love it. Do, do you know how much worship goes on on the ski resorts around Seattle every winter? It's amazing. The worship that's taking place up there. The praise, the thanksgiving, the, the conviction. Oh, wait, no, it doesn't. No, I need to ski. That's all. But I've had so many people tell me that they worship, you know, when they're out there skiing or fishing or gardening or, you know, and I'm glad for all that. But the bottom line here in this passage is because of God's mercy, our response is to show up. Be present. Make ourselves present. Because then God can get a hold of us and, and he can begin to show us our next steps and, and what he wants to do in us, what he wants to do through us. He can start to show us those things if we present ourselves. Now, um, the next thing that this talks about, though, is um, because there's a lot more uh, to being not a pagan than just being 
not an unchristian thing too, you know. It's like, there's a lot of details here. And so he says, we have to present yourself. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. But be, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Don't be, or some translations you might have say, don't let the world push you into its mold. Remember that? Uh, there's an old, old experience I had. When I was a kid, um, we lived in San Diego, and uh, there was a place called the College Grove Shopping Center, which now I think they're calling it College Grave. Uh, it's kind of died out. But um, College Grove Shopping Center, and they had, this would have been the equivalent of really high tech. This is uh, before computers, obviously, before sharp pencils, really. And, uh, and they had, at the shopping center, at the College Grove Shopping Center, they had this big machine. I've never seen anything like it. And uh, you put a quarter in it, and this big mold kind of mechanism would work, and it would inject pink liquid plastic into this thing, and it would come together, and it would make a pink plastic piggy bank. It would drop, and you'd watch it being made. I mean, this is high tech, you know, this is amazing. And I, I watched that thing, you know, and uh, I remember one weekend I was there and, and we showed up at the center and there was this huge crowd around this machine. And I thought, you know, okay, I've seen it, you know, how many pink plastic pigs do you need? And, um, and so uh, I kind of pushed my way through. The machine had gone crazy. <laughs> and, and people put their money in, and then the mold thing starts working, and it shoots out the liquid plastic, and it starts to mold, but then it kind of shoots more liquid plastic, and then it kind of opens and shoots some more, and, then, and these monstrosities were dropping out, and it wouldn't stop, and it just kept shooting. <laughs> I thought of the church. <laughs> I was the first thing that came to my mind. <laughs> I thought of the church, and this something's gone wrong here. But, but that idea of being pressed into a mold and being shaped by, by the world. You say, don't, don't, don't let that happen. Don't let who you are and how you respond and how you think and how you worship and how you live your life be molded by the world. Now, if we don't let the world push us into its mold, what can happen? Well, here's what it tells us. Don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, if, if we can stop being squeezed by the world around us, we can actually think differently. We can have renewed minds, and, and, and we're not locked into certain ways of, of thinking. Oh, good, good art, huh? It's <laughs> now starting to look like it's a fried egg. <laughs> Think different. Now think about this, because what happens is, um, We've had a lot of pressures in our lives, growing up, in our families, and uh, our experiences of the church, or uh, wherever we've gone. There have been things that have influenced us and that shape our thinking, and, and it leads to reactions to things, and, and uh, it, sometimes it, it pushes us forward, sometimes it causes us to pull back because our thoughts have been locked in, often by unhealthiness, right? And... Uh, we need to have a new way to think. We, we, need, we need God to uh, give us renewed minds. Um, now this is also uh, psychologically sound, actually, not just, it's true not just because it's in the Bible. Uh, the uh, psychiatrist Albert Ellis uh, developed this whole therapy called rational emotive therapy, where the essence was, if you want to change a person's life, change the way they think. If you change the, the way they think, then the emotions will react differently, and choices will be different, and decisions will be, and, and behaviors will change, and the whole world can change if you just think different. But then, you know, in the church, I, I found that there was this huge tendency to try and get everybody to think the same. 
And then I realized, oh my goodness, that pushing into the mold also happens in the church. And, and we aren't able to have renewed minds. So what would it take for us to think differently and to not allow ourselves to be pushed into um, people's um, molds? It goes back to mercy. It goes back to uh, if we can experience God's attitude of mercy towards us. Now, you know, I've been a pastor for way too long, and the thing that I've discovered, almost everybody who comes to church struggles with something that has to do with their attitude about God, right? And they, and they come in, and they're afraid to get involved, and they're afraid to let loose, or they're afraid to do something, because at the root of it, they have this, this weird thought about God's mad at them, or God will be mad at them as soon as he gets close to them, or we have to protect ourselves from, from, from God, um, and I think over the last 40 years or so, I've had hundreds and hundreds of counseling sessions that usually came down to, God is not your father. Get over it. He's not your dad. Which actually is good psychology too, okay? So I put that on, uh, even though Albert Ellis didn't come up with that. He's not your dad. Don't... Don't confuse the two because God wants to show you mercy, radical, radical mercy, tenderness, care. That's the root from which we show up and we allow to transform the way we think. And then we can think in a, in a free way and in a new way. And, uh, and we don't have to live um, to, to please other people. We don't have to worry about that anymore. We don't have to wonder what other people want from us or what they, what they might want from us and how we could, you know, please them. Uh, a couple of us were talking down in the kitchen this morning, getting ready, and, uh, and I, I remembered a great quote from my favorite theologian, uh, Chris Christopherson, and, uh, and uh, this is what he said. If you try and please other people, you will pay a terrible price in your soul. You pay a terrible price in your soul, and um, and I think that that's that freedom to not do that comes from thinking differently, and discovering what God's essential um, attitude towards us is. And then the old thinking that clouds our mind, that confuses our choices, and that uh, it clouds our mind about ourselves so that, so that we don't have really clear self-perception because we've got these attitudes floating around there, and it, and it uh, clouds our mind about other people, and prejudices come up and, and get reinforced because of the old thinking. So what does it say? You transform by the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve God's will as good, pleasing, and perfect will. And then I say this to you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God's given to you. In other words, get a different self-perception. It doesn't have to be blown up because you're trying to look better. It doesn't have to be deflated like the footballs in New England uh, because uh, oh geez, was, did I just say that I'm sorry <laughs> all you viewers in New England I'm sorry I didn't mean that you know, but uh, anyway it, our, our self esteem gets deflated be because of uh, bad thinking it says, so when it comes to your self perception look at yourself soberly Clearly, see who you are in light of the faith that God gives to you. Let that be the thing that defines your self-esteem. And, uh, and, and we become more, more free. So then, then when we have that, what happens? Don't think yourself more highly than you ought, but think yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God's given you. And then it says immediately, just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members don't all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others, and we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If a person's gift is prophesying, let him use it. 
in proportion to his faith. If it's serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. You get on that? If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it's leadership, let him, let him lead. If it's showing mercy, do it cheerfully. All of a sudden, our world, the way we relate to the world, is no longer inner focused and it's no longer looking at ourselves because we now have a sober judgment about who we are as, as faith gives us. And so we're free. for gift-based ministry. Not ministry based on guilt, not ministry based on pressure from others, not, not, not ministry based on what we wish we could do, gift-based ministry, which by definition is outwardly focused. So it starts with God's incredible mercy towards us. Deep at the core, ends up with an outward focus. Serving, leading, giving, showing mercy, teaching, whatever it is, doing it. Because that's who God calls us to be. This is the circle, I think expanding outward of what it is to be a follower of Jesus. I'm sorry, let's move that thing. I don't mean for that side of the room not to see it because it's so beautiful. <laughs> uh, starting with the mercy, deep in the core, and then we, we show up, we present ourselves, our bodies and worship, we think differently, and we begin to reach out in gift-based ministry. This is the model. It's, it, it's not bad people and good people. It's transformed people by the power of Jesus, what he wants to do in us and what he wants to do through us. So I have a homework assignment for you. As you know, I would. I want you to write down two questions, and I want you to um, write out the answers to them this week. And you can email them to me if you'd like. Here's the questions. And these are questions that I have given to you so many times, but you've not written them down. Okay, class? <laughs> class! So, um, first one is, what would Christ have happen in you this year? What does he want to do in you this year? What does he want to do for you? What's his transformation look like in your life this year? I don't care about five years from now, you know, but just this year, what, what does he want to have happen in you? And the second one is, what does he want to have happen through you? What, how does he want to use you? How does he want to give you faith and giftedness uh, to serve and to reach out and creative ways? What does he want to do through you? You need to ask those questions to the Lord this week and, and write down the answers for them. And we'll begin to see what God's about in ourselves, in each other, uh, in, our, in our church family. Okay, that's enough for now. Um, let me pray with us. And then we've got lunch downstairs, uh, a veritable plethora of lunch. <laughs> Uh, and then we'll have our meeting to time together. So Lord, we've come, we've presented ourselves to you in worship, and we ask that you would, you would open us up to experience your tender mercy, your love and care, and then transform us as you would do, not as we would do, and certainly not as anybody else would do us. We need you, and uh, we ask for your guidance this year. In Jesus' name, amen.